Oh, burning yes. question for you. Whoa. Light, yeah. Lightsaber hot burning question for you. Very apt question now that the Ahsoka series has come to a conclusion. And we saw a number of lightsaber colors in this series, including orange, white, blue, green. I think we saw a red one from the Inquisitor as well. Um, it's a question I think we've all pondered as fans of Star Wars at, at, at one point or another. What color would you would your lightsaber be? What what is your desired lightsaber color? Should you wield one? So now I'm looking at all these colors, and I feel like purple because it's a very neutral. I believe is what it is, like a a middle of the line. A, so purple and orange are the two sort of straddle ones. Yes, blue blue and red, and then uh, orange is. Um, I mean, not orange. What did you say? Purple and what? Purple. It, not no, I, you orange, added orange. Um, orange was not what I was what I meant, but orange is like a dulled down red, so it's not that evil, which we saw with Ray Stevenson's Balin Skull and Shinhati in this series. Uh, but I don't know if you're a purple guy. I, I don't think you you could have the dark side in you. You know, no, but purple is balance. Purple's yeah, I guess it's maybe balance. Mace Windu, bro. Yeah, I know, but. I don't, although considering your hog size, maybe maybe you'd be allowed to to wield purple. Uh, I, I for me, it's like always going back and forth among blue and green, right? Because those were what Luke wielded in the original trilogy. It's what most good uh, Jedi wield between blue and green. I feel like green, just because that was Luke's final form, was a green lightsaber is the way to go. But I'd love to see if you could get into like shades of blue and green. You know, like a real dark emerald type, or like. Maybe a baby blue would look nice. I would also wonder if there are Jedi, obviously like Ahsoka, for example, bled two red colors to get to white. Could I figure out a way to change my lightsaber based on mood, a mood ring of sorts of a lightsaber, you know, if I'm feeling kind of mean, maybe it's a little more red than, than it was previously. So orange is strength. I feel like that's me, you know, tenfold, obviously, <laughs> but what I also like is the look and just how it pops on screen of the red of the dark side yeah obviously red is iconic i just i feel like you'd have to embody the red and, and i'm not so sure you i like you don't get angry enough to have a red lightsaber i think i could wield red i think i think i could could be a, a sith type you think i can't get angry go ahead uh you know say something uh mean about me uh, I don't know if I could say something mean about you, but I'll just say spaghetti sucks. Oh, stop. <laughs> oh, quit it. <laughs> One, two, three, yeah. Mac and Goom. Jaws three. Mac and Goom. King of Queens. Mac and Goom. Meryl Street. Mac yeah i'm goo and i'm mac we are the mac and goo program we bring you friendship yeah and today we're bringing you renewed or rejuvenated friendship in the form of ahsoka goo is that because i bought you a keychain oh uh, that's true goo goo let me show it what's this let what's me this? uh let me show you my little present from goo here this is a nice ahsoka lego figure keychain which Will never be going on my keychain. That you know what I gotta. You know we had we were talking about nachos the other day. I have a thing with keychains too. Mm -hmm. Too many people have too many things on their keychain. Now I think in the last ten to fifteen years we've gone away from some of that because remember when we were like eighteen, you'd have your gym card, you'd have your CVS card, your Stop and Shop card, yes. all that shit in your keychain. Now it's all digital. So we it was a George Costanza wallet it, around hundred percent, hundred percent. But you still see some of the olds rocking keychains like that or people with just way too many keys i i would venture to say you could have two keychains you know you have a keychain with a lot of your spare shit and then your main your go-to keychain for me i i've got a keychain with like four keys on it if i put anything more on that that's too many things you've heard of their first just like boy meets world mac hates janitors <laughs> And also the key fobs. Those are sort of cumbersome, too. Those aren't small, so those take up space. I think I have four keys on my keychain right now. Three go to my house, and one goes to my parents' house. That's perfect. That's all you need. Anything more, start a second keychain. Although I don't have my car keys on my keychain. Those are separate. I wish they were really? on my keychain, though. I don't know why you're doing that. Because they don't have a loop on them. Your fob doesn't have a little loop in it? 
What's a fob? For the car fob. You don't have like a fob with like the remote start and all that shit on it? You are speaking a different language to me oh. right now. All right. All right, Google. Well, you get an old. You do. What year's your car? What's, what's it? 2010? 2022. Oh, no. Wait. So you have a 2022 without a key fob? I got a Tiggy. Hmm. That seems. You might just not know what's going on at all with your car. Let's, oh, stop. There's a possibility. <laughs> Goo! Today we are speaking about the latest, and one may say the greatest, uh, Star Wars television show here. The latest entry into the Star Wars universe. Obviously now, I think we're, what, four years into Star Wars show? What was season one of Mando? 2019? Yeah, it was right around when Disney Plus started. Was that 2018 or 2019? Okay, so we're we're obviously been swimming in these Disney Star Wars uh, shows for a while now, and we I think the last movie we got was 2019, right? Rise of Skywalker was 19. Yes. So it's been predominantly it's been heavy on the shows lately, and they've obviously bumped the movies off based on the reaction to the sequel trilogy here. And uh, I think they're they're short. Obviously, you know. Boba Fett stunk. Obi-Wan stunk. Um, those were filling some gaps here, but it seems like the new stuff they've done. So Mando and or and now uh, Ahsoka feel like they've hit the mark for the most part. Yes. And I am three episodes into Andor. Don't spoil it for me. Ooh, well, I haven't seen it. So I think we can say without a uh, without a doubt in our mind. Yeah. This without is a shred the, of doubt. This is the best Jedi show that they've given us so far. Well, yeah, it's really... Oh, it's either I mean, this or Obi-Wan. Yeah, I mean, that's not really saying much. We'll get to some some scores in, in a few minutes here. So, Goo, of course, like you said, this is a Disney Plus show rated TV 14, an action adventure drama fantasy and sci-fi, which I actually think it did all five of those things quite well. Do you think that season. it warranted the TV 14, though? Uh, could have been more. Could have been more. Although there was some good s lightsaber slashes, yeah, which is probably why it fits in right there. But there was no real swear sexualization. The, I'll tell you, the oh, one. No, I don't know about that. You see, Hera. Ah, uh, very true. Real nice dump truck there. Oh, let me ask you a question here. Is she wearing a pair of shorts on her head? <laughs> like a pair of boxer briefs on her. Skull? Yeah, just to keep everything intact there. Like yeah. I was watching it. I was really distracted by that when watching the finale. <laughs> I was a little distracted by her eyes. Her eyes were very blue, but I got over that once she turned around, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, this is uh, this has a runtime of 362 minutes, Goo, roughly 45 minutes an episode. I almost felt like we could have gotten a little bit more. You know, we got eight episodes of roughly 45 minutes an episode, but I felt like we definitely could have used a little bit more of what they were playing with. But do you also feel like they could have cut two hours out or... I don't know, whatever it is to make like 225 to make a really tight, good movie. I don't know if you could have done this series as a movie just because they jump around two or three times. And, it, and it, it's it's not it is it's sort of two continuous stories throughout. But like, for example, episode five, the Hayden Christensen episode, the Anakin episode. You really couldn't have done that in a movie, right? Like that works because it's a single. Episode it is a TV show. You're series, absolutely right. But let know? me also say this. And this is me as someone that keeps saying, do we need to give flowers to him after what we got from Anakin in the prequels? The stuff with him in this series is fucking great. It's yeah, so good. It's really, and really good. As someone who, for a part of this show, didn't know what was happening and just mm -hmm. didn't know what was going on, <laughs> that stuff, even if you didn't fully understand it visually, was great. Yeah. And that's one of the things here. And I heard which 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 I heard that Andor is great visually and, and whatnot. This show really nails the background stuff, the visuals, the composition, everything surround. Maybe there are people out there that didn't care for the story during the season, but everything else they fucking they nailed. It was movie quality. Yeah. Yes. And like I wasn't the biggest fan of the first three-ish episodes of like even the look of the show and the choreography of the show, it felt a little stale to me. But once we got him in there, it really kicked to a whole new level. Yeah, because it, it added some gravitas to it, you know. It mm -hmm. added some stakes there. No, but I also, think. I think the lightsaber fights were also better after he joined. Like, after that, maybe they put a little more attention into it. Yeah, I, I, don't, I think they were sort of consistent throughout. But I think what happens, in, in, and this is true about every lightsaber battle, 
the the battle itself all the ones that you've been in (laughs) the battle itself is telling a story from the characters so if there's a lightsaber battle and one of the characters you don't care about it the you just don't like it doesn't hit the same and i think for and this is more for you and for anyone that didn't watch the animated stuff once anakin was introduced to this show it brought like it brought a fundamental understanding to the show like you you're like okay now this is going somewhere now this is meaning something to me as a viewer because you didn't watch the clone wars you didn't watch rebels and largely this show became an extension of rebels right and that's one of the main reasons why i wouldn't call it lost but i was disconnected from what was going on on the screen yeah i i understand that i don't agree with it but i understand what you're saying because uh, it was almost the opposite for me. It was so satisfying to see these storylines go from animated to live action. Goo, yeah. on Rotten Tomatoes, this season of television, Ahsoka, season one, which some people are saying maybe we'll get a season two. I think it's pretty... From the business office of Boston Show. I'm sorry, go ahead. <laughs> How did that feed into here? That was unbelievable. I'm going to turn the Bluetooth off. Go ahead. <laughs> um, oh, I lost my train of thought. What was I saying? Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, Did I just ruin the episode? I just lost my train of thought completely. I was like, is that me? What the fuck? Um, <laughs> I'm trying to figure Look out what at the your fuck notes. I, was I know, but what was I saying right before I was going to get into the Rotten Tomato score? Satisfactor. You were satisfied. Yeah, all right. All right, all right whatever. Go. <laughs> On Rotten Tomatoes, 87%, 71%. And it's really hard to, um, I mean, we've talked about Roddy T's and how it's, you can't really believe in it anyways, but especially with Star Wars fans, they're worse than Marvel fans. They're worse than DC fans. It's hard to trust any singular Star Wars fan on their opinion because there are so many types of Star Wars fans now and and what hits and what doesn't for certain people is different. For example, you would you feel confident reviewing this show uh, to someone knowing that you hadn't seen rebels or hadn't seen clone wars. Like, does that make you comfortable? I don't feel comfortable right now. (laughs) So the shows are hitting different for different people, but 71% goo just seems low. Like it, like, I don't know how someone could watch this show and not like it, I guess. I think it's just the disconnect from the characters. I feel like, yeah, but it's even that, still, with everything they give you on screen, but it's, it's like enjoyable. you're jumping in mid story. That's all. Okay. Yeah, and and ultimately, where we see this show, you know, a little bit of a spoiler alert here. There's an Empire style kind of yeah. ending, and so this sort of fits as the middle movie in a trilogy, if you want to frame it like that. And Rebels sort of serves as a new hope, I guess, for for lack of a better term. And I ho- hopefully the final final the Filoni movie is a great finale sort of return of the Jedi. Like that's, I guess the hope for, for me personally, but goo on Metacritic, this show was given a 68. I feel like, again, that's too low. And to put some perspective in there um, of these star Wars shows that are relevant to this. So I'm not talking like bad batch and shit like that. Um, Rebels, the animated show got a 78, which I agree with. I think that's probably at least compared to clone wars. I, I prefer it. Cause there's, they don't waste as much time. Goo, Mando season two at 76. I think we both, or you liked season one more than season two. I like season two more than season one. I think I like them both pretty similar though. Okay. But I think we both agree season three less than those two. Not a big fan of season three. Yeah. No. It wasn't, wasn't the greatest. Uh, Andor has a 74. So ranks third amongst these star Wars shows. Mando season one at 71 season three at 70 clone wars at 66. So that's the first one below this. And then book of Boba Fett. Uh, at 59. Did I mention Obi-Wan got a 73? So I don't, not. Uh, I don't know how you would watch Obi-Wan and watch this show and say this is definitively worse. Obi-Wan is a returning character that everyone knows and loves, and they also gave us another character that people at least knew and have loved in the past. So do you think the Obi-Wan scores are completely held up by the two or three Vader scenes? I think so. Uh, that's kind of dumb. I don't like that, Gu. I hate well, that, in fact. I mean, I'm uh, not a big fan of that show. I'm, so. I'm just like as a Star Wars fan, and and I can't pretend I'm a mega fan. And obviously, I've been pretty hypercritical of Ryan Johnson and some of the decisions that Kathleen Kennedy and Dave Filoni have made over the years. As a Star Wars fan, this was exactly what I wanted out of a show. 
lightsabers, force users, a story that is pretty easy to understand. It's not convoluted. It's just, I like, I don't understand what more you would want out of a Star Wars show. Yeah, I agree. No, it's, it's good. <laughs> like, I don't... like I, there are people out there, and obviously you started it, that are saying, and or, and or, it's the best Star Wars show. And I agree, maybe, it, it, like, in a vacuum, maybe it's the best written show. It's not at all what I'm looking for from Star Wars. Okay. <laughs> Do you agree? Disagree? No, I'm I'm interested in good storytelling, and this was pretty solid, but also it's like watching Dune Part Two without seeing Dune Part One. Yeah, but I don't like I don't know if storytelling was ever the best part of Star Wars either. You know what I mean? So it That's the it, hero story. It's not necessarily a great criticism because those original three movies, it's not a great story. Ah, the story of of uh, Empires. Great. What are you talking about? Uh, uh, Have you ever been to Cloud uh, City? <laughs> Goo. This series was created by Dave Filoni and written. He wrote all eight episodes and also directed episodes one and five. One, obviously, we're reintroduced to several of these characters. Five is the Anakin World Between Worlds mm -hmm. episode. Um, this has been a long time coming for Dave Filoni. Goo. The first episode of Star Wars The Clone Wars, the animated show, was October 3rd, 2008. Goo, the finale for this show, this season. October 3rd, 2023. 15 years oh. Dave Filoni has been working Symmetry. Ahsoka. Yeah. Working Ahsoka into Star Wars. Ahsoka is his baby. Ahsoka is the character he created for the Clone Wars. And it was in 2008 and with Clone Wars that Filoni really took over the mantle for Star Wars. Obviously, George Lucas is like always semi-involved. But Filoni sort of became the George Lucas of Star Wars from that point moving forward. So I always I don't really understand these people that um, don't think that Dave has a hand in everything because very clearly he does. And Kathleen Kennedy does as well. Um, but like he's in charge of the direction that they go in. And so he's always responsible when when they falter as well. But I, I think it's pretty cool to see that uh, a character that was not even in the prequel trilogy, obviously wasn't in the sequel trilogy, started as an animated character, comes so far and. I don't know if she's my favorite, but she's pretty damn close for all of the Star Wars characters we've seen in this universe. She's she's for sure one of the best characters. Do you think they regret not having her in the prequel trilogy? Um, well, she probably wasn't conceived at the time, right? It probably right. something that Dave thought of while that those uh, three movies were being made. But I also feel like she became a way for Dave to save that prequel trilogy a little bit. So if she was involved with it in it, I don't know if she'd be able to save it. Right. And then also adding on another child character after what you gave us, and we're not here to insult the kid who played Anakin Skywalker, but he got a lot of shit and it seems like maybe they were trying to move away at that time from having another kid actor on there. Yeah, and also, um, and they, they underscore this really well in the World Between Worlds episode. Jake Lloyd! When Ahsoka joins this Clone Wars, she's like 13 years old. And yeah. you sort of forget that as... A child as they soldier, dive, if you will. As they dive into deeper things here. And, and the setting of this, or the timeline of this series is important, too. I think we're about 11 years after the Return of the Jedi. Is that, does that sound right to you? Yeah, because isn't Mando season one like six years after? I think so, it's like nine years, years after. Okay, so I, I want to say either way, we're within we're like just past a decade. Yeah, and we're 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 basically set right after season three of Mando too, because I believe we're it's still acknowledged, stewing in what just happened. I believe it's acknowledged that Gideon is dead, and that happens at the end of Mando season three. So that's roughly where the timeline of this show is. Go uh, other directors of the season: Steph Green did episodes two and three, Peter Ramsey episode four, Jennifer Getzinger. Episode six, uh, Gita Patel, episode seven, and Rick Famayua, episode eight. He they seem to bring him in for some of the more important episodes. If it's not Favreau or Filoni, seems like Famayuma does the important episodes. Synopsis Q. After the fall of the Galactic Empire, former Jedi Knight Ahsoka Tano investigates an emerging threat to a vulnerable galaxy. It's good enough. Yeah. Good enough. You, you don't really need to tell us. Ahsoka Tano's back. <laughs> This show stars Rosario Dawson as Ahsoka Tano, David Tennant as Hu Yang, Natasha Liu Bordizzo as Sabine Wren, Mary Elizabeth Winstead as Harrison Dula. Also, a special shout out to her co-star in the rear there. 
Uh, Ray Stevenson as Balin Skull, who I'll just say now, we'll get to him uh, in Max Credit Union as well. Incredible casting, incredible job. Obviously, he's going to be missed going forward, and they really set something up here that I don't know if we'll ever see. Uh, Ivana Sakno, Sakno as Shinhati, that is Balin's apprentice. Uh, Diana, Diana Lee uh, Inosanto as Morgan Elsbeth. Iman Esfandi as Ezra Bridger. Hayden Christensen, of course, as Anakin Skywalker. Lars Mikkelsen as Grand Admiral Thrawn. Now, he voiced uh, Thrawn in the animated show, and they yeah. bring him back for this, which I thought was a great decision. We also see Evan Witten as Jason Sindula, who is the son of Hera in Kanan. Uh, Genevieve O'Reilly is in here as Chancellor Mon Mothma for a couple episodes. Paul Soon Huang Lee as Captain Carson Tiva. He's been in pretty much all the animated stuff. He's one of those fibers that connects everything. Uh, Gerald Prescott. Uh, these are the three Night Sisters that we see goo here. Uh, Gerald Prescott as Actrapa, Claudia Black as Clothau, and Jane Edwina Seymour, not the Jane Seymour that we know and love as Lachesis. Mm -hmm. And then we also have Wes Chatham as Captain Enoch. He's the gold face guy. That's sort of uh, Thrawn's first in command there. Those are all the, the people we would need to know here. So again, I think this takes rough. This takes place rough, roughly 11 years after Return of the Jedi. And that is interesting because in season three of Mando, or at, even in two, we see Luke is building this Jedi temple. So it's roughly around the same time. And, and so Luke's operating in this universe so I think in the back of all of our heads, we're sort of wondering where Luke is, right? Always and forever. <laughs> no, no. It's like um, when New York is being attacked, you're like, where are the rest of the Avengers? Right, right. Exactly. Uh, the, so the two main storylines in this season uh, is number one, the continuation of Rebels, finding Thrawn and Ezra as they get blasted off into another galaxy at the end of that series. And number two, and you could maybe argue this is more important because it's the namesake character. It's Ahsoka coming to grips and moving on from who her master, Anakin, became. You know, she's yeah. been dealing with this trauma for many years and sort of trying to accept or avoid the fact that her master became the most evil person in the universe. And because of that, trying to avoid having her apprentice fall down the same path. Right. And that's a very important note. I'm glad you said that. Uh, it has fundamentally affected all of her relationships with other Jedis and imp more importantly, her apprentice Sabine Wren. And so that, that moment in this series where she sort of um, either forgives or accepts what that fate was and what her master was and how she couldn't really do anything with it was huge. And, and it, we only see a little bit of it going forward in the last couple episodes, but I think that's really going to mean more when we get to the movie that Filoni's make, making here. Um, and then if the C story we get here. Uh, is Balin Skull's pursuit on Peridia and what, what his ulterior motives here and what's calling out to him. And they don't really even touch upon that in the finale. They just sort of, they show you that one image and you're like, oh, this is pretty interesting. Yeah. But what, what are we going to do now that Stevenson's dead? So I did watch the new Rockstar recap and it mm -hmm. was suggested doing it animated. Yeah, I think that's a great idea because I don't know if you could recast Stevenson and get someone that even... I don't know if you could get like even 50% of what Reese Stevenson did. He was truly uh, maybe the best character in, in this whole season of television. So, by the way, for breakdowns, uh, we suck. We're not very good at this, but new rock star, screen crush, they all have great like episode by episode recaps. They're really good at pulling the straws from where it came from, too, like yes. where it, what it touches back on and what it could be going forward. They have Wikipedia bookmarked on their computers. <laughs> yeah. um, so, again, I think this having like three pretty clear stories. Uh, was a big benefit to this show. It doesn't get diluted. Like the, one of the biggest issues with the Mandalorian and it's three seasons is in its eight or nine episodes during the season, there's guaranteed two or three that have nothing to do with the season. And, and this season of television that, didn't have that. And what sucks about that is you have stories, like you can stretch them out and play with them a little bit more. And some things feel too long and then other things feel too rushed. Right. Right. And this this wasn't affected by that, which I which I think was huge. Um, however, I will say, and, and this has been a pretty common or prevailing thought um, after the finale. This show really peaks right in the middle of it. Episodes four and five, I felt like are the two best episodes. Maybe the finale is third. And we never truly get back to the high of the middle of the season. And that's sort of hard to sort mm -hmm. of deal with in your brain when you're when you're evaluating the season. 
Um, I will say though that I sort of foresaw that, and that's one of the first things I told you after the first two. Or what three are episodes. you, a night sister? <laughs> I felt like it was going to be a bit of a lackluster finale, and I and I do feel we we did kind of get a, a lackluster finale just because not a ton happens, right? There's no real uh, ramifications from the finale other than you know I I don't want to spoil it quite yet, but there's not like there's a lot of players still here, you know. They don't really finalize anything. Okay, shall we get into the gauntlet? Yeah, 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 yeah. All right, Mac, fun factor. You just mentioned the finale. And one thing about it, and I mean this in the nicest possible way, it felt like the final level of a video game where you need to like keep on going. Like you're trying to enter the castle and you need to do the steps to get in there. Sure, sure. And you have little battles along the way, but then you yeah. never got that final battle. Right, right. And that's sort of what I'm referring to. Mm -hmm. But I, again, it's sort of what I thought was going to happen anyways. So I do think it was a really cool final battle with Ezra, Sabine, and, yeah. and uh, Ahsoka versus all those like dark troopers or whatever, night troopers, whatever the hell they're calling them now. But you never get the satisfying Thrawn Ahsoka that you thought might happen. Way to cover Satisfactor, Bozo. How about <laughs> Borometer? Were you bored? Well, I still have some more stuff in, in Satisfactor there. I have to say, and it's, it's just to echo my point at the beginning, this was by far the most satisfying Star Wars show, especially live action I've seen. Something I've been wanting for years, and we finally got it. Um, but again, there was some element of dissatisfaction with the finale. I would argue season two of The Mandalorian was way more satisfying. Um, it had a very satisfying moment. But the season in couple general, moments, even when they reintroduce Boba Fett in that season, you're like, this is extremely it was cool. It was cool for sure. I agree. And obviously that. they kind of undercut that. And we're not here to talk about those shows, but they undercut it by giving Grogu back to him immediately. Yeah, that sucked. That was stupid. but whatever. Borometer. I was a little bored. Yeah, not an ounce here. Not oh, okay. not once during this this run of episodes. Um, and I think it's the first time out of all these live action ones we could say that I was engaged the whole runtime, and that plays into them not going down fucking stupid paths throughout the season. Halloween, will your interest in this show go down over time? And Mac, I'll say this as I eventually watch Clone Wars, say with my son, when my son is of age, we'll sit down and we'll watch all those animated Star Wars shows. This show might get better to me. Yeah, uh, that's a good point. I didn't think about it from your perspective. Um, you never do. <laughs> this is an interesting for one for me because there's not a ton of finality here. Again, it does feel like the second movie or the second part of a story that has an end coming that we haven't got to yet. Um, so if the Filoni movie that we've been promised, if that delivers, maybe I'll come back and watch mm -hmm. some more of this. But if that doesn't deliver, I think this story will look a little worse. Aquator, it's better than Aquaman. For sure. Pants 10 City. Excite Bike Mania. What got you going? And it was specific stuff from the episodes with Anakin in that uh, non-world, in that else world, in that else world galaxy. Between the world between worlds. That was beautiful. And then also bringing it back to the Clone Wars. Like that episode is like, wow, this is this was worth it right here. Yeah, that that episode five. Um uh when Ahsoka falls into that world between worlds and finds Anakin who, and it's, it's a very tense episode too. Cause the whole time you don't know if Anakin's good or bad. That takes you back through sort of the Genesis of their relationship and how that evolved over time and really underscores how fucking young Ahsoka was when that, all that shit happened. That was just a great episode of television, a great star Wars moment. Um, separate from that, I thought each episode did a good job of having like one standout scene one scene that you're like, okay, that was awesome. Let's move on to the next thing. Max Credit Union, who are you giving credit to, Bozo? Again, Ray Stevenson here. May he rest in peace. I thought he was fucking amazing. I think he was the best character during the season. Unfortunately, we don't really get any time with him during the finale here, but what he was going through and what that journey he was going on, I'm super intrigued by. For those of you tardy to the Mac and Goo party, we rate everything on a 40 hot dog rating system and Mac... Although, I wouldn't say that I was lost in the story. I did feel disconnected from certain characters. I did feel like things were thrown upon us where I didn't exactly know what was going on. But if you take that out of it, if you take the story out of it, 
the visuals of this show was top notch. Ray Stevenson was great. His apprentice on the show was great. The, the composition of the show, the music of it was John Williams esque. The, so good. I wouldn't call it sound effects, but it was the way the music was used to either introduce or um, when certain characters were subtleties changed. they used. Yeah. Yes. It was amazing. Like that stuff was fucking dead on. That's perfect Star Wars stuff right there. Ahsoka's good. I like Sabine. I like all these characters. I just don't love them because I don't really know them. I like Fair. the little turtle guys. Yeah. Those are cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the Anakin episodes are really the standouts. And you don't even need to. So like say if you don't want to watch this show, that's fine. Don't. But watch those episodes. Watch the two. Is it one and a half episodes? Um, it's so yeah, it's kind of one and a half. Right, whatever. Episode five Watch. is the Anakin episode, but he pops up in a couple others. Watch the episode that at the end of the episode, it's him. And then you get the full episode after that. Four Watch that five. one episode. Yes. That yeah. one I will say is a standout for most of the star Wars shows. I love that episode. And I'll also say this. I have no idea what the fuck is happening with these whales. <laughs> oh, the purgle. What is like they're losing their mind over these whales, and I'm fine with looking at them for a second, but they focused on these whales for a long time. The only reason why uh, you can go hyperspeed and jump in the Star Wars universe is because of the Purgle. They developed a technology based on those those Purgle. All right. So they are fundamental to Star Wars. <laughs> so I will give this, like, I'm going to say like a 33-34, but... I want to give it an INC. I want to give it an NA because okay. I don't feel like I watched the first act of this play. Yeah, no, I think that's that's a fair assessment from your perspective. And and I think the more I'm thinking about how this show fits in to this Thrawn story and, and the Ahsoka story, it really is and feels like the second movie or second act of a three-part yeah. story. And I feel like this show became and, and it's uh, well out there people are sort of phrasing it this way this is dave filoni's love letter to the animated shows to the clone wars where ahsoka is introduced and she is anakin's apprentice and the relationship that those two have over seven seasons is really hard for someone to grasp if they haven't watched the clone wars exactly like going into the show you had told me everyone had told me reading up on it that like she was a different character than all these other jedis and then when the show starts, she's pretty much the same as how Obi-Wan is at the start of his show. Yeah, she's she's more reserved and And jaded. I'm like, why can't she just smile? <laughs> <laughs> That's a joke. I didn't mean that, guys. Uh, so when you're missing that aspect, a very central concept to this show is the relationship between Ahsoka and her master, Anakin. And beyond that, uh, where Rebels introduces Thrawn in this whole story with Hera, Zeb, Ezra, Kanan. When you're missing that, it's really hard to um, sort of uh, dive into the emotions behind a lot of the shit in this show, especially what's at the core of Ahsoka and Sabine's relationship and how Sabine's sort of established as sort of a wild card in, in that show. You're missing all of that. Um, but again, I feel like this this show is Dave's love, love letter to that. And those two shows essentially went so far into redeeming the prequel prequel uh, trilogy, right? Because there's you're, you're, you and I included don't care for the prequels. There are moments in there that we enjoy. Revenge of the Sith in general is pretty decent. Um, but I think Dave really propped up the prequel trilogy with the Clone War series and then into Rebels. And I feel like, Goo here, we could be bridging on to a part, which I'll get into when we talk about the finale. I feel like Dave might be moving on to either retconning the sequel trilogy or there's a chance here he could be attempting to prop that up as well with where we go from here so i i don't know if that's uh what he's thinking about or if he's just trying to keep this Did you know that Ray's a palpatine thing. well we'll we'll get to that um i loved this show i do feel like it lacked that cherry on top at the end here but again, that's because it's not a conclusion. And I feel like if, if we were looking at this from 3,000 yards away or if like the original Star Wars movies, we consume them all back to back. 
So at the end of Empire, we're able to move on to the third story and then reassess where Empire was and how that affected the third Could story. Could you imagine waiting three years? And that's what's going to happen here. So I feel like over the years, people loved Empire more because of how it ended. But in the moment, I'm sure there was a lot of people that were like, what the like, fuck Like even is this? going from Infinity War to Endgame, it was one year. Right. Right. I couldn't imagine three. And it's probably, we'll probably be waiting three years for this. For those of you out there who was born during this time, who was alive during this time, who was a Star Wars fan in the early 80s, and you had to wait the three years, let us know what that was like. (laughs) Yeah, right. And I, I think there's a chance that this stands up as the Empire leading into that movie. Now, I'm not saying that's gonna happen, but they sort of set it up to be an Empire like, uh, you know, Cliffhanger is not really the word, but uh, it's just the way Empire ends where everyone's kind of at peace, but the war's not over. It's the same shit here. So if that movie delivers, if that third movie, if that Filoni movie delivers, I think we'll look back on this and on Rebels and Clone Wars and be like, man, that was amazing. Just the way we all do with the original trilogy. So I, I have this at 37 hot dogs. Oh. I wanted to go a little bit higher. But I am a little annoyed having to wait. And maybe that's just a me thing. I was sitting 37, 38. It had 40 hot dog potential. Like at the end of, like in the middle of the season there at four or five, it was tracking for 40 dogs. But then the last three doesn't move as quickly. It is it is vital and important to the story of these characters. It just didn't quite reach the high I was hoping for. You're but just it's mad not like that you have to wait. Yeah, for that's sure. That's the reason why you took dogs off? Well, it's your money and you need it now. <laughs> and part of it is it, it's a little bit like you, you did make this point. It's a little bit like that Dune movie where like it's incomplete. I don't have the conclusion to the story. And that's it's it's frustrating is what it is. It's not necessarily good or bad. It's frustrating. And I can't not let that affect the way I view this. And that's why I'm saying if I was able to view this in context with the movie, maybe this is 38 dogs, 39, 40. Guys, go on Twitter right now. Tell us if you saw Lion King 2, Simba's Pride, before (laughs) the Lion King, and you had no idea what was going on. Um, I think this is, to me, the only thing that's in competition with this, and now you'll maybe you'll be able to tell me with Andor in a couple weeks. For Star Wars live-action shows, to me, this was the best one a little bit ahead of season two of The the Mandalorian. I would take the first two seasons of The Mandalorian over this. Really? All right. All right. That's a fair perspective. Yes, but you're also starting from scratch, kind of, because you are yeah. picking up in that same galaxy, but you're starting from scratch with those You're characters. not missing anything there when you start. Exactly. Shall we spoil? Yeah, let's get into it. Spoilers, spoilers, spoilers. spoilers, spoilers. Before spoilers. we get anywhere, Mac, in the finale. Now, I generally hate when bad guys do like the explaining of what they're doing to the heroes, mm-hmm. whatever it is, but there is a point at the end of that finale where Thrawn almost taunts the Jedi's behind him or the Jedi. Sorry, that's plural. And I'm like, that might be the coolest bad guy thing that he's done here. Where yes. he's like, long, Thrawn- long live the empire. <laughs> Fuck <laughs> you guys. And he just takes off. That I think that's the biggest thing. I, I think you can obviously pick up on the Ahsoka, Anakin stuff, and even yeah. the good guys from Rebels. But I think what you really miss without having watched Rebels is how calculated and I kind of picked up on that. Is. I did pick up on that, but also I did love the part when he finds out that Ahsoka was Anakin's apprentice. One of the coolest moments he's in like, the whole season. Huh? Yeah, because he realizes, I think if he, if he's afraid of anyone ever in yep. his whole life, it's been Anakin slash Vader. And obviously he worked with Vader a little bit. We've just never seen it on screen. So when he finds out that Ahsoka has not only been able to get into the galaxy that they're in, that she is also the apprentice of Anakin Skywalker. He's legit scared. He's like, we got to get out of here. When he doesn't does even want to fight her. Out? When does uh, the movie come out? I'm not sure. I think 25, I want to okay, say. Okay, so I need to watch all of these shows before that time. You got time. You got time for sure. Do uh, I? Because I got to watch more VMA recaps. <laughs> but I, but <laughs> what I really liked was Thrawn assessing the situation and being like, we have a lot of people here and it's only three Jedi, but... The last time he fought a Jedi was Ezra and he kind of took the L and ended up in a different galaxy. And this time Ahsoka is added to the mix. He's like, we can't even take our chances here. We need to stall them and get the fuck out of here. I love that. And that also underscores Ahsoka's potential, which she finally reaches here after going through the world 
between worlds and all that. So everything's sort of peaking, right? Everything's coming mm-hmm. to to this peak of the mountain, and then the series just ends, and that sort of plays into my my frustration. In the movie, do you think that we get? So we get Grogu, we get Ahsoka, we get Ahsoka's friends. And then do you think we get AI Luke Skywalker? You have to, you have to get Luke in this because you also, and they try to do it in the, in the sequel trilogy. You have to explain how Luke gets from um, super like uh, optimistic and training all these Jedi to isolating himself on a distant planet, you know? And they didn't mm-hmm. do a good enough job of that in the sequel trilogy. So that's sort of what I'm talking about here, where I think there's a chance that Dave is going to prop up that sequel trilogy with what comes next in this story. Why line. is Luke like that? Why is he by himself right. drinking that blue milk? Right. And that beyond city? that, um, and we are on the spoiler, so we can talk about it here. At the end of this, um, all we get in this whole finale episode from Balin and Shin is one moment where Shin goes and meets up with those sort of ravager types and that's kind of intriguing where she goes from there but Balin something is calling to him on Peridia Peridia is this planet that they're on um, something beyond what he's ever experienced and we start getting into the gods of Mortis which are introduced in the Clone Wars and in the gods of Mortis there are three figures the father the daughter and the son the father represents balance of the force the son's the dark side the daughter's the light side and the well, daughter's missing her head well, in that storyline, um, she Ahsoka and uh, basically becomes the daughter. You see Morai the owl, that's also representative of the daughter. So that she Ahsoka is essentially the daughter. Um, we're trying to figure out what's up with the son and the father here. Is Balin the now the father or is he the son? Is is he taking the mantle? of the dark side or the balance. I'm not really sure. I think you could argue it goes either way. I think you could argue that Balin has sort of become the son figure and that Anakin is actually now the father, the the being that represents balance. Because I think, and this plays into the storyline in the world between worlds, I think it shows now Anakin is also now fully balanced in the Force. So it, I think it makes more sense for him to be the father than Balin. But some people are saying Balin takes up the father and maybe uh shin hati is this is the sun type figure uh but more importantly we see there that the the statue of the father is pointing out off into the distance at this beam of light into the sky and, and a mountain there and this could be getting into something that i really know nothing at all about uh there's a character in star wars lore called abolith who is actually the mother figure so it's these three and then there's the mother and apparently abolith was so powerful and so dark and twisted that these three together decided to imprison her in like some void space. So she's trapped out somewhere so that no one had to deal with her. So I think one of the possibilities here is that Ray Stevenson's character, Balin, uh, maybe goes and frees Abolith, and then Thrawn actually has to deal with the consequences of that and, and fighting for power and control with Abolith, who is just sort of above and beyond anything we've ever seen beyond Vader or anything like that. Um, That's really interesting to consider, but I think the alternative here going back to maybe propping up the prequel trilogy, I think there's a chance that uh, what, what is calling to Balin is Palpatine centric. I think there's a chance that um, Palpatine's force ghost, ghost or Palpatine's being is what is calling to Balin. And maybe it's Balin that sort of, sets Palpatine free, and that's how somehow, quote-unquote, Palpatine returns. I think that's in play here. That's not something I necessarily want, but I'm not going to rule it out based on what Filoni's done prior and sort of saved other Star Wars properties. I think there's a chance that Filoni shoots for that here, sort of explaining the Palpatine stuff through this Balin Skull stuff. I'm back, baby. (laughs) Do you want to run through the finale first? Do you want to run through those first seven episodes real quick? Does it, no, just go through the stuff that matters to you from this show. Um, all right, well, let's just go through the finale then. Um, okay, I on Peridia here, which is sort of introduced to us, I, I think it's in episode four they arrived there. It's sort of given to us as like an afterthought that they're just here and this is there's some night sisters here and Thrawn has teamed up with them. But as we go along in the second half of this season, we start to realize that Peridia, in and of itself has major importance. And now obviously we see the statues 
of the gods of Mortis here at the end. But I think there's a chance that there's a whole se season or movie's worth of a story to tell about the history of Peridia. And now, obviously, at the end of the season, not only is Balin Skull still there, you still have Shinhati, Sabine, and Ahsoka. So you have four pretty powerful force wielders stuck on Peridia. That has to matter. That has to mean something. I just worry that they don't go down that path now that Ray Stevenson has passed. Oh, let me ask you too. Now, um, what was the planet that the bad guys were going to at the end? I'm blanking on it. Uh, oh, that was Dathomir. Okay, so are they going? Because I know that they mentioned on you know one of those channels that uh, that the Almighty, uh, you know, Force bad guy there. I'm doing a real bad job, Star Wars wise, right now. But uh, that they might be trying to revitalize him. Yeah, so that's something from the video games that I don't know all that much. It's a, it's a, mm -hmm. it's an old race, an old being that probably was on Peridia as well. That I guess he's been like isolated in Dathomir. But mm -hmm. the the bigger thing here is the Night Sisters and the Night Brothers hail from Dathomir. Maul's yeah. from Dathomir. Thrawn is going to Dathomir with this ship full of the all these casket type things. Goo, and that was one of the big questions from the season: is what the fuck is in these casket things? Um, you maybe thought like stormtroopers that they might resurrect, which I now don't think is the case. I think there's a pretty good argument that this might be a society of night sister and, and night brothers that the night sisters may, might've sort of been using Thrawn to get to their end game, to get back to Dathomir and sort of rejuvenate that society on Dathomir, which could bring not Maul in, but more Maul type characters in um, if they bring Dathomir into this whole mix. But Thrawn's not stupid. He has to he has to know that that's a consideration for the Night Sisters as well. Um, there was also a really interesting thing that happened during this finale episode where Morgan Elsbeth sort of becomes full Night Sister there, and they give her the Sword of Talzin, which was originally wielded by Darth Maul's mother in the Clone Wars series. Darth Mom. Is... <laughs> yeah. Talzin was her name. Um, that was a cool little thing there. I'm actually glad to see Morgan Elsbeth taken out of the equation here. Uh, that was a cool fight scene, by the way. She, the, the, I don't know if it was the, the actress that played Morgan Elsbeth or if it was a stunt double. That fight scene with her and Ahsoka was pretty cool. Um, I will say that when I saw it, I was like, "What is this sword? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what is this uh, one?" If you remember, is, this, is it Hulk saber? What is how this? how Mando gets the Beskar spear? It's from her. She's the one wielding oh. that against Ahsoka in Mandalorian season two. Okay, so that's that's where she came from originally. Go. The lady that plays Morgan Elizabeth has a real funky walk. It's almost like a hop to her walk. Incredibly distracting. Just one one thing I'd like to note there. I don't like the way that that woman now, walks. Now, did you see the floor? Are you sure that she wasn't playing hopscotch? <laughs> I'm pretty sure she was not playing hopscotch. What Goo. did she have a skip it per chance? <laughs> Goo, another minor disappointment for me in this finale. Um, and this is this finale plays into to to the dog score. Uh, no Kanan here, no force ghost Kanan. Kanan was voiced by Freddie Prince Jr. in Rebels. I thought that would have been a nice touch, however, they do mention him. Uh, Ezra, Sabine, and Hu Yang have a quick conversation while Ezra is building now his third lightsaber that we've seen him build. Built uh, it pretty quick. Well, he's pretty how many kyber no. crystals does he have? I don't know where they got the kyber crystal. That's that is an unanswered question, nor do I really care about it, to be honest with you. Um, but there was a nice little nod to Kane in there, which is good. Uh, then we get the Ahsoka, Ezra, and Sabine fight versus the night troopers and zombies type thing. That was a nice little thing right before the Morgan fight. Um, can we finally see Sabine fully capable of wielding the force? She force pushes Ezra up onto the ship. She recalls her lightsaber. Um, I think this was there. Some people are like, oh, it's too quick. She went from not being able to use it to use it. I think this was the perfect excuse. Real Mary Sue, if you ask me. It, it's it's perfect because to me, and this happens, you see this in superhero movies, right? When the powers finally manifest themselves, it's when they really actually need it. Someone their love, like their love interest or someone they love is needs saving. And, and that's exactly what happened here. Ahsoka and Ezra needed saving. And finally, the powers came it's through. It's like I if that I got fine. trapped under a car, my yeah. three-year-old son could pick it up. 100%. That's His powers would manifest right in that moment. So At I least thought for that his was, mom. I don't know about me. <laughs> I thought that was perfectly fine. Um, so now, obviously, Thrawn has escaped back to the main galaxy, heading to Dathomir there. We see that. It's going to be pretty interesting to see how much time he has 
to sort of fuck around in the galaxy before Ezra or Luke or anyone sort of confronts that. Because without Ahsoka and Sabine, he sort of got free reign here. What if the movie starts and it's their ship and out of nowhere, the Millennium Falcon lands on there and Harrison Ford walks up and he goes, I don't even fucking want to be here. <laughs> It's also very fitting that Ezra and Thrawn go back together as they they obviously got to uh, Peridia together. So I, mm-hmm. I liked that little nugget. Um, again, Balin and Shin have now gone their separate ways, but they're both on Peridia. There's a really interesting dynamic to play with there that I, I'm not sure we'll ever get. Because Shin's a pretty interesting character, too, beyond Balin. Like, she's obviously conflicted, and, sh- and she shows that throughout this season. Yeah, We just haven't quite gone down that path Do yet. you think she's going to get her own show? No, she won't get her own show, but I I think she's an interesting enough character that she should show up going forward. But to, you know, have time wasted on her, say, in the movie? Well, she's obviously tied into Balin, but she's, again, her being on Peridia is significant. Very clearly, they had plans for her and in, in Balin going forward beyond what Ahsoka and Sabine are going to do. But the fact that all four still left there is very intentional, obviously. Mm-hmm. Um, we see uh, back in our main galaxy here, Ezra escapes Thrawn's ship, goes and has a nice mo- moment with Hera, who's sort of a mom figure for her. So that was a nice, uh, nice reunion there. I think it's pretty obvious here that you'll see Ezra training Hera's son, Jason, just the way Jason's father, Kanan, tra- trained Ezra. I think that's going to be pretty cool going it's forward. It's the Big Brother program of the galaxy. <laughs> uh, and again, Gu, we, we're left with a, a bit of an Empire-style ending here. You have Ahsoka and Sabine looking into the stars, into the galaxy, with Thrawn completely in another galaxy. Um, and you get a really cool shot of... Uh, Anakin, Force Ghost Anakin looking down at Ahsoka. And you also get the little note, the little nugget. Sabine finally kind of senses that Anakin's there, but she can't quite see him, I think, because Anakin only wants to be seen by Ahsoka. But, like, what gives him the right to be a Force Ghost? Well, he's, he was the chosen one. I think that's pretty I know. clear. Killed a lot of kids. He sure did, but he redeemed himself. <laughs> and, and, I, and I think, so part of Anakin's redemption arc is Ahsoka not becoming Anakin, right? Hel- her, Him helping her along that path. And I think this plays into the Gods of Mortis thing too. I think Anakin, because of all the highs and lows he's gone to, is fully balanced. I think he makes most sense to be that father figure, the figure in the middle of everything. It just makes too much sense to me. I would have um, liked it if he showed up as the Forest Ghost and then Yoda and Obi-Wan like walked up behind him and they were like, we're still not cool with you. <laughs> You stand over there. <laughs> um, over there! I said, I said over there! Again, I want to reiterate that I'm pretty sure Rebels is going to represent a new hope. This represents Empire Strikes Back. And the movie that Filoni's making will represent Return of the Jedi. I think it's a very similar arc to that. And I'm perfectly fine with that. The new, The sequel trilogy got killed for having that sort of arc that the original movies had. That's a that's a good story. You don't got to change it. It's not world breaking, but if you nail the characters, we're gonna like that story. Just keep on keeping on. Uh, Goo, a couple of questions I have now that we're at the end of this season going forward. Again, where's Luke in all this? Is he aware that this is going on? You would think, other than Ahsoka and actually probably Balin. Balin showed himself to be pretty fucking powerful. Luke's got to be the most powerful person in the galaxy, and coming with that means. He can tap into things in the force that most other people can't. So you have to think he he should be able to sense a little what's going on here. Right. So he will have to, you're calling him negligent. (laughs) He will have to confront Thrawn at one point. I'm just wondering how they're going to make that work. I'm, I'm pretty intrigued in that. And also we saw him building that Jedi temple. What other Jedi are with Luke at this point, you know, is Ben solo with Luke at this point? Would Ben be a child at this point, or is he born yet? We're 11 years after Return of the Jedi, so we could have like a 10-year-old Ben Solo. Mm. Be so interesting. You, yeah, that is pretty interesting, actually. Because Force Awakens, I think, is 25 years after Return of the Jedi, right? Does that sound right? Sure. And Ben Solo is probably about 20 or 25 years old in the beginning of that movie, I'm guessing. So Ben Solo might be in play here, and again, that plays into maybe... Dave trying to save that sequel trilogy, which I don't know if it can be saved. Um, no Zeb here, which is a character 
you briefly saw in Mandalorian season three, but he was pretty prominent in Rebels. I wonder why. I wonder why he wasn't with Hera at the end. I w- it seems really interesting to just throw him in Mando season three, but not have him pop up. Oh, shout out Tim Meadows. Yeah, sh- yeah, always shout out permanently. Every episode, shout out Tim Meadows. Yeah. Um, Q, I really like this show. I- I'm just, I'm hesitant to to love it 40 dogs worth because I have no fucking clue how that Filoni movie is going to play out. So that shouldn't affect this, but it does in the moment right now. It does maybe in six months, I'll be more comfortable with how I view this, this season of television, but I loved it. I could have liked it more. Um, and maybe I will going forward. Also shout out to the little girl. I don't know how little she is. I'm sorry for saying little girl, but the girl, the woman, the young lady who, plays the young Ahsoka who also played young Gamora and she was in Marty this past summer. Yeah, what a what a couple of years for her. She was uh she was young Gamora in Infinity War. Yes. She was a pretty central character in Barbie which made the most money out of every movie ever except for like 5 and she plays young Ahsoka here. So she's she's the she's daughter of a hot start. She's the daughter of uh, the Mad Titan, one of the greatest movie villains of all time. And then she mm-hmm. is the apprentice to Darth, Darth Vader, Vader, one of the greatest movie villains of all time. Yeah, incredible run for Ariana Greenblatt, who's, what's she, like 17 years old? She's a young girl. I don't know. That's why I have I just threw a bunch of different, you know, ages. I think she's a teenager. I, was, I don't know how Teenager. Old, yeah. She's one of the brats. <laughs> I didn't mean to push this. But it works for Thrawn. Thrawn. Yeah. Shout out Thrawn. <laughs> Let's get into Max. And Max, that could be anything. It could be a boat. And Mac, this week, let me, uh, first off, are you a fan of apple picking? Uh, Not really, just because you end up with too many apples. Mm -hmm. You know, you never utilize all the apples you pick. We have an agricultural expert, someone who loves apples, loves apple picking at work. And uh, mid conversation with him, I'm like, "Oh, what's your favorite kind of apple?" And he's he's you know breaking down all the apples. I'm like, "Oh, sure, I sure. like I like Honeycrisp." And he's like, "Oh, that's the basic bitch of apples." <laughs> hey, you know what? I'm a pumpkin spice guy. You're a Honeycrisp guy. We're just a basic bitch podcast. But I'm like, I also like the Cosmic Crisp. He's like, "Those were a waste of money." <laughs> so what's like, well, hold on, hold on. We need a power rankings of apples from this fella. Oh, I will. I will ask him. I will What's get a full favorite? power. What did he ranking. say his favorite was? I just kind of blacked out after he said oh, that. You just you were just down in the dumps after that. I, just, I just picked up my phone and just <laughs> called it a day. Just took a nap. Like that's that's it for me for the day. All right, where can the people find us, Mac? Uh, you can find us on Twitter and on Instagram at Mac and Goo Podcast, and every other platform we are Mac Ampersand Goo. It's Mac Shift Seven Goo. That includes Facebook, Stitcher, TuneIn, Castbox, Speaker, Google Play, iHeartRadio. Uh, we're on Spotify, but more importantly, we're on Apple Podcasts. Get on there, rate, review, subscribe, five stars. If you do that, we'll get you a free Mac and Goo T-shirt from the folks over at Watertown Sportswear. That's Watertown Sportswear on 34 Mount Auburn Street in Watertown. WatertownSportswear.com, expert screen printing and embroidery. Stay tuned next week for Mac doing something on Monday, and then Goo will be back by the end of the week. So, now it's time for girls jumping on trampolines. Bye. Please flip the cassette over to side B to continue the adventure.